We're recording today on the lands of the Jagera people, and we acknowledge the traditional elders here, past, present and emerging. It would be great to be able to acknowledge as a nation um, the atrocities that have happened in the past to our First Nations people and actually be able to close the gap on the inequalities that still exist in our communities. Hello everyone, I'm Andrea, former registered nurse and midwife in private practice and welcome to Beyond the Rona. And I'm Tim, I'm a small business owner and digital marketer. So in episode zero, we introduced ourselves and what our motivation was behind this um, Beyond the Rona and how we, um, we were introduced to politics to begin with. And now that we've had a few episodes um, since then, uh, what were your three big things that you think we need at this stage, Tim? Yes, the three big things. Uh, so I've realised through you know um, being more involved in community initiatives that actually, as a community, we actually have a lot more power than than we realise. The minute that we start, um, you know, coming together and using kind of our collective power, and I think that sometimes we do feel that we don't have a lot of power to kind of make the changes that we want to make in our communities. So I think yeah. that that's. You know, something that we need to to realise is that we we actually do the power is in in our hands, and if we're not happy with something, that we can all kind of collectively make a change. I guess the the, yeah. the second idea is around that uh, lack of media diversity, uh, not only in Australia but right here in Queensland. There's a, a real um, concentration of media ownership, which. Uh, you know, if you look anywhere kind of around the world at, at kind of like good um, or, or better media environments, they are diverse and you hear a lot of different voices. And so I think even things like this where, you know, where we're representing ourselves and we're able to, you know, um, partake in kind of the, the discourse of our community, um, things like this are, are really important, but also at the higher level where it's more into kind of mainstream media, we do need a more diverse mainstream media here in Queensland. And then I guess the third point is uh, we, this is a, a little bit kind of like uh, what you hear politicians say a lot, but like investing in jobs that all of us, you know, the jobs for the future that can actually, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about like underemployment, um, especially, you know, in, in areas, suburban areas like Logan or, or insecure work. And we just keep talking about it. We don't actually, as a society, there haven't been um, big changes made to actually address that. We seem to be just acknowledging it, but then realising that that just keeps rolling on and on. So uh, actually, as a, as a country, making that decision that we need, you know, better, secure um, and long-term jobs, especially for jobs in, in the new economy, in the digital economy, um, in, in renewables and how we can move and transition our workforce to these more secure roles. Yeah, I think they've lied to us. You know, for a long time, they've been telling us that, you know, if they do move to renewables, that um, that we're going to be wrecking the economy. There's, there's not enough jobs in renewables and, you know, this, that and the other, but there's actually more jobs to be had. Yeah. And, it's actually better for us. Um, you know, I know we've got a lot of tradies, a lot of people who are looking for full-time work. Um, you know, surely moving to renewables is where the jobs for the future are. Yeah. Um, you know, I had my, um, my three hmm. big things were that I wanted this bottom up approach, which I think is like one of the motivations between be, behind what we're actually doing. I wanted to actually, you know, this is why I wanted to talk to the community members was I wanted, you know, to be able to um, change what has been going on, especially with this, um, you know, this government that's been going on for the last eight years. I feel like instead of this trickle down economic economics that they've been trying to push on us, it just hasn't been working. Um, and I feel like, you know, we're measured by how well our, our most vulnerable people are doing. You know, this is not me making this up. This has been, you know, researched again and again and again, and nobody's listening to it. Um, and this includes women and young people and, um, you know, and healthcare and welfare payments. You know, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, anybody should be in poverty here in Australia. Um, yeah. And it's not just me saying that, it's a lot of voices have been saying that. Um, 
that's my number one, you know, so that's quite a big, a big thing. Um, and I also think we should separate religion from politics. Um, I'll go into that in another episode, but yeah, it's a big thing for me that I feel mm. like we've got, um, I don't think we've got that right. And coming from a woman's perspective, um, it, if, yeah, if we go back in history, I feel like there's a lot of oppression there where, um, you know, I, I think our guest might be able to expand on that um, when we talk to her in a bit. But I feel as a woman, if I was looking for a domestic violence service, um, I would not be going to a religious service, um, you know, and I think our politicians, when they say, oh, yes, we've got a domestic violence service for you, um, but um, we're not going to offer choice between a religious service or a another um, service. I, I think we've got to offer people choices. Um, so we've got to separate that. Um, and then um, an inclusive and free education for everybody, because I feel like, you know, we've got to include everybody in education and I don't feel that it's completely inclusive and I'll do another episode on that down the track as well. Um, Logan is a place where we have large numbers of vulnerable people. It's a, you know, generally a lower socioeconomic area. Um, we have large numbers of people with disability, people with mental health issues, domestic violence issues, people who rely on charities to make it through. Um, but it does include the working poor as well. Um, like you say, we do have more um, collective power than what we realise, though. I mean, there's a lot of people living in Logan, Brisbane area, um, but I feel like they um, maybe are a bit sort of like they feel like they don't have a say against our politicians. They have a lot of mistrust. Um, Tim, what do you feel are some of the issues that might affect the people in Logan? Yeah, I, I definitely there's there's that, and I think there's the mistrust, and and also like, I guess you know when they look at their lives, it's like, are they are their lives improving? I think that's like a really you know big big determinant of you know is the situation getting better, or or do I feel like as an individual and for my children, my family that we're going backwards, and I think that that's a problem um, on the ground is that there isn't a sense of improvement. Um, and yeah. then at the same time, you have yeah um, certain parts of the media and certain parts of of society that saying yeah we're it's we're, we're growing and the economy is booming and it's never been better and all this kind of stuff and it's like uh, there's a, there's a big disconnect between I think people's real uh, lived lives um, and and so in saying that I think yeah it's up to us it's up to like our decision makers to. Um, do something about that at a at a ground level, and um, you know I look at programs like I guess just in my world around the the kind of digital and kind of innovation side. Look at programs you know that are springing up in Logan. So I've got hope that you know more um, that we can tackle you know education issues so that we can kind of prepare our young people so that when they graduate into the workforce and when they they move into adult life that they have opportunity and that, that they can see that the, where those opportunities are and that they can actually leverage them. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can yeah. improve. Yeah. One of the, um, things that I found, I was having a quick look on, um, you know, through Google to try and find domestic violence help. Um, and one of the things I found, I put in the search terms domestic violence and Logan, um, and I found it was kind of difficult for me to find the help that I was looking for. I did find like um, women's legal service. I found men's legal services. I found like men's rights groups. I found um, St. Vincent de Paul, you know, these sorts of things, but there weren't many places that could help me if I was like um, multicultural, you know, multilingual First Nations. There was like two Chinese groups and um, I think there was like one Cambodian or something like that. But I mean, we have a lot of people who speak all different languages. Yeah. I would think that there would be a need for like multilingual domestic violence groups. I don't know. I mean, I, today we're joined by um, Joe West, who's the founder of Four Voices. 
um, which is a domestic violence, um, like they help women who um, are affected by domestic violence in Logan. Um, thanks for joining us today, Joe. Is there a lot of uh, multilingual people who access your service? Um, lot, lots of people from different ethnicities are right around the service we offer. Uh, we go to not just Logan, but also to Ipswich and Denala and um, into central Brisbane. And, um, you know, the, some countries that we, we speak to people from countries I've never heard of before, speaking different languages I've never heard of before. So abso absolutely right. there are. And the, the, the problems of domestic violence are made so much more complicated by, by different uh, multi, like, cultural issues. Right. And so how do you get around that? Like, do you have volunteers who can speak different languages or how do you like how do you get around that? um we uh well we, we only started about 18 months ago and um initially it was like figure it out as you go along and oh let's grab google translate and let's figure it out using google translate which right which produced some hilarious responses sometimes as google stuffs it up quite frequently but um but uh, more recently we've become members of the uh, translation and interpreting service so that and that is that, oh, okay. that is astonishing because, like for, for instance, we had a lady that um, came up to see us from Myanmar, like ex Burma, um, who who spoke right. very little English, and she had a wad of paperwork uh, that she'd received from Centrelink to complete. And we have no idea. I mean, the, the the paperwork is complex, even if English is your first language. Never mind if it's not. Um, and yeah. she handed us to us, you know, as if to say, can you please complete it for us, which was impossible without her input. So we connected with the translation interpreting service and uh, yeah. she speaks Rohingya. And uh, I said, oh, can, can we have a translator that speaks Rohingya? Yeah, just one moment. 20 seconds later, this guy, this guy yeah. comes on the phone and says, oh, um, you, want, you have someone that wants to speak Rohingya? Yeah, absolutely we do. And... Um, Put put it oh, put wow. it on loudspeaker, and you could just see this lady. The tension just oozed from her body as she could speak in her her own right. language. So that's an extraordinary service, and you know people that are accessing benefits or trying to access benefits like welfare and like um, you know food and clothing and um, shelter. Uh, it's made so much more complex if you don't know the you know don't know where to go and you don't have the command of the language incredibly difficult right and so the people who access your service have they got access to the internet um yes and no it depends um we we uh, we deal with a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness um so uh they uh, and fun fact um 80 of people who are homeless in this country have a mobile phone so, um, you know, their mm. lives, are, if you think about it, if you're homeless, you know, your life is actually on your mobile phone. So um, they may or may not have data. Um, and if not, we, we can help connect them because our, our services, our van is outfitted with Wi-Fi and we can connect them. Um, but, yeah, very, very difficult, okay. uh, very difficult to access anything when you're on the streets and you don't have money. Right, and you were telling me that your that Four Voices runs um, like a resume um, service. Can you tell me a bit about that? Four Voices is a connection service. Okay, so what it, whatever okay. that word connection means to you, and so we define connection for basically four different ways. And the first one is social. So a lot of the work that we do is just social connection. Which, if you think about the pandemic has given rise to social isolation such as we've never seen before. So the fact that we've got a coffee machine on our van and we can say, hey, come over and have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and let's connect. Um, that that with, for, for somebody who is in trauma, such as a woman who is experiencing or escaping a domestic violence, can be, can be just amazingly comforting, if not life-changing. And the second, the second right. form of connection is digital. So that might be just helping connect with the internet. It might be helping people with MyGov or Centrelink inquiries or claim forms or, um, or, or the myriad of things that you can do on the internet. The third thing is, is employment. Third connection is employment, which is, yes, about helping people that are ready in their part of their journey to get back into the workforce, sprucing up their resumes, creating resumes, setting up seek accounts, helping them apply for work, etc. And then the fourth type of connection 
is what we call community connection, and that is actually helping people access other services. So you think about it, we're, we're, we're out in the streets, literally out on the streets, and we're not asking people to cross the threshold into our building, our office, to assess what they what might need. And for many people, just doing that is extraordinarily daunting. You know, for you to be a victim of domestic violence and to say, I wonder if Centrelink can help me, you've got to have extraordinary confidence and, and, uh, and gumption to cross the threshold into Centrelink offices to see, see what you can access. So our service, because we're on the street and say, hey, would you like somebody to go in with you, somebody to literally hold your hand and support you through the process? Think, think mm. about being a, a woman who's escaping a domestic violence situation and is traumatised and is looking over her shoulder because she doesn't know whether she's being followed or tracked. Um, to have that kind of comfort that there's somebody in her corner, somebody that is actually going to help her talk. Because one of the things that really bugs me is that a woman in this predicament, no matter who she goes to for help, they ask her the same questions. So, you know, tell us about the domestic violence. Tell us when it happens. Tell us what he does to you. And with every telling, she's reliving that trauma. And, mm. and, and that's, that's terrifying. And to the point where it stops women from accessing service. I don't want to talk about it anymore. So I'm not even going to bother. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to help provide that cushion between her and other organizations that might be, may be able to help. That's what we call community connection. Yeah. And so how many vans have you got on the road? At, at the moment, we're still a pretty new charity and we've still got the one that goes around to 12 different locations throughout Brisbane, Logan and Ipswich, but desperately keen to expand. Okay. And um, so how did you get started? Um, I have a, a background in homelessness. My son started a, a, a homeless charity called um, Orange Sky, you may have heard of, the two young boys that put... Mm. Uh, Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, they put two washing machines and dryers in the back of a van. Yeah. Yes. So they... Uh, that was your son? Yeah, yeah, that was my son. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. He doesn't know much about laundry, but he... Uh, <laughs> Does he do the laundry at home? doesn't know where the laundry is. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> your son is a legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's how everyone tells me. But, yeah, Runs in the family. Uh, yeah, well, I, I inherited his genes, so... Yeah, <laughs> Um, no, he, so I learned a lot about homelessness because I worked mm. with him for four, four years as that organisation. Is he married? No, no, they, they, <laughs> they knock at the door though, I'll tell you. What's his number? <laughs> um, anyway, I, I learned a lot about homelessness working with him and uh, one of the things that um, uh, I, loved, I love about Orange Sky is the, the uh, unique way that people connect. You know, so you imagine being homeless and, and marginalised, you're ignored by a great chunk of the society today. Um, and mm. so the only thing that you can do when you're washing someone's clothes is to sit and chat to people. So that's where the, that's where mm. the magic of Orange Sky really was formed. Yeah. And, um, unfortunately, uh, Orange Sky and many other homeless service providers see mainly men. And um, the, the, the statistics show that it's nearly equal male-female terms of homelessness so the, there's right. a lot of females who remain invisible and another statistic that you mm. may be interested in is that um, of the of the um, 51,000 women who are homeless in this country 33,000 of them have escaped a domestic violent relationship that that kind of stat does my head in because if mm. you mm. if you think that you're going to be safer on the street potentially living in a park or you know in your car maybe even with your kids safer doing that than staying in your own home with an abusive partner. That's how terrifying it is for some women. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted and to start something that was more specifically for people in that situation because I, I felt that there's a gap in, in what, what, what we as, an, as a country offer to people in that kind of predicament. So rather than orange, yeah. we're, we're purple. We've got the whole van thing going on, but we're, we're purple, not, not orange. And we're predominantly, we, we don't knock men back, but we, we predominantly focus on women because we go to places like crisis accommodation centres and shelters and uh, refuges. And, um, and then we stand out the front of um, Centrelink offices where lots of people go to determine whether they're eligible for certain benefits. Yeah. And so in your experience... Um, 
you know, we get this on social media, we get this, like the men's rights groups are, are really quite vocal, especially now that they've, um, I've noticed now that they've had this $5,000 offered for um, domestic violence victims. And so where I've seen this announcement on social media, underneath have been all the men's rights groups, um, people attack that um, an announcement and say, you know, this is not a gendered issue. Domestic violence is not a gendered issue. And you see this written all the time. In your experience, do you feel like domestic violence is a gendered issue? Oh, well, the vast majority of people who are victims of domestic violence are female. That, that's just fact. Um, so, certainly okay. it's, not, it's not the exclusive domain of females. Um, there are we've okay. met numbers of men, but the, the numbers of men that we've met that are victims of domestic violence are, uh, are, are uh, you know, of the order of, of one in ten. Okay. All right. So, you know, that's what you've experienced. I mean, yeah, on social media, you, you, they're just so loud. They're just so loud to dispute that. And I, and I think um, we're right to we're yeah. right to recognise that um, that domestic violence doesn't pick sides. You know that, that there are victims from um, uh, from all demographics. Um, we talked before about you know the, the multicultural issues. I think that the, certainly there are men who are experiencing domestic violence. Different cultures experience more domestic violence than others. And it's 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 just a fact. Disabled people. I, I was reading some hor horrific statistics about disabled women. And you're, more, you're twice as likely to experience domestic violence if you're disabled in this country. It's disgraceful. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about age, Joe? How does age play into that? Um, look, I don't have any statistics on that for you, but um, just anecdotally, um, the, the, women, the women in their um, over 50s that we find um, d deny deny domestic violence. Um, you know, if it's if it's oh. not physical, it's not domestic violence. And we all know now that we're better educated that there are multiple different forms of domestic violence, and some of the more insidious forms of domestic right. violence are not physical. And yes. many many yeah. women in this older age bracket um, are victims, and that, uh, uh, w without recognising it or, or acknowledging it, and so many. Um, people in that older age brackets just stay there because that's that's a generational thing that you 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 yeah. married for good and it doesn't matter whether you know he he gets a bit hot under the collar every now and again you know we we we're, we're in for the long haul so I think that so that would be that other stuff like financial control and you know tracking where they're going and all those other things that aren't you know. Or emotional abuse. Yeah, or emotional, things, psychological, you know? financial, spiritual, there's yeah. all different sorts of abuse. As I said, um, we have lots of women who say to us, I'd sooner have bruises. Yes. yes. Uh, bruises yes. heal. This other stuff doesn't. Wow. Yes. Yeah, and you do hear that, um, you know, a lot of women, what I was sort of um, alluding to in my three big things, where I wanted um, religion separated from politics and, and uh, that sort of thing, I, I do find that in strict religious, um, you know, maybe Catholic, maybe, um, you know, like fundamental Christian um, unions, um, that women might feel a little bit oppressed and that the men are okay with that because that's the way that the church was you know that it was okay for the for the men to tell the women what to do and to you know to be in charge and um you know sometimes women don't like going to i don't know whether you've had this experience but sometimes women don't like going to church run domestic violence shelters because that kind of re-triggers them um is that your experience? I, I, I'm, sure. I'm not sure I have got enough data to differentiate, but, okay. but I, I do know that um, there's a reluctance generally for uh, women in these kind of predicaments to reach out. That's why that's why I think that um, a mobile or outreach service like ours is really, really important because yeah. they they don't seek they don't have to make you know pick up the phone, search on the internet, go into a building. Um, you know, you pick up the phone to some domestic violence organisations, and they have to be uh, they have to be asked so many questions. And 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 I've seen women put the phone down. Like I'm terrified about mm -hmm. the questions that they're going to ask me. So I'd sooner not ask for help. And so many women go back to their abuser because it's just 
the, the options aren't there or they don't feel the options are there. Uh, right. There's mm. plenty of help out there. Yeah. But it's really difficult to it's really difficult for them to navigate their way through that help when they're traumatized the way that, that many of them are. And what are the barriers for people who are looking for jobs in the Logan area, do you think? What are the barriers for the people that um, come to, you know, to your service? Um, look, I think that there are jobs for people who are, just, who are definitely, um, you know, willing and prepared to keep chipping away at it. Unfortunately, we find a lot of people who, who aren't, you know, who are in that predicament where, I mean, if, if you're in one of these sort of situations, your job is to survive. And to, to, to right. say, just go and get a job if you're homeless, you know, that's just so unenlightened, you know, because your job is to stay alive. Your job is to find where you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, you know, that, that kind of thing. And for a woman who, who's, who's ex escaping domestic violence, getting a job is the last thing on her mind. She's got to figure out where she's going to be, that she's going to be safe, where her kids are going to be safe, yeah. how she's going to actually get through the emotional and psychological turmoil that she's been in. So, you know, we're finding that the, the people vary in the stages of their, you know, I hate the word journey, but, you know, I mean, the, their journey back to, to, to reconnecting with the community. But those who are ready, um, you know, we find that there's an appetite for work and I, I, I think work is out there for, for people that really desperately want it. Yeah. So um, I guess... Before we wrap up, um, what do you feel then, Joe? are the three big things that, from your point of view, that the Logan area really needs um, to help us move through, you know, now that we're getting on top of COVID and, um, you know, from what you've seen, you know that there's a big problem with a lot of these social issues. Um, domestic violence is one of them, but, um, you know, I suppose, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of other social issues that are mm. going on in Logan um, due to it being, I suppose, a lower socioeconomic area and the problems that come with that. What do you feel from your experience are the three big things that maybe the Logan area needs now that we're getting on top of COVID and kind of turning the corner and we're looking to rebuild? Um, I, look, I think that to me, everything comes back to connection. You know, I think that there's, a, there's a, a, an absolute crisis of ignorance in the Logan area about, uh, uh, not just Logan, but in, in, in most socio, low, lower socioeconomic areas where um, people that are on the streets, for instance, are marginalised and, and dismissed. And, you know, people that have got, um, you know, substance abuse issues, mental health issues, um, difficulties c connecting with regards shelter. The, the housing crisis is out of control. It is absolutely out of control. And so yeah. I think that uh, I think that there's an ignorance uh, when I hear people say, "Just tell them to get a job," or you know, "Just tell them to get out of that stupid toxic relationship she's in." He's an idiot, you know. Like get out. It, it, it's just not that simple. And, and I think yeah. that we need to be we need to open our minds to. Uh, listening, you know, no, no six-year-old child says, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a drug, drug addict. You know, nobody does that. It's like drug yeah. addiction or mental health issues are all byproducts of your lifestyle or your or, 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 the, or the life that you've you've led, and not all of which mm. is under your control. So I think you know, by by us being able to be um, more um, accepting and less judgmental. Um, we, we hear some extraordinary stories from some extraordinary people. I jump out of bed every day knowing that I'm going to hear some incredible story from some amazing human being. And, they, the, and many of them are homeless or many of them uh, are addicted to some substance or other. But their stories are mm. extraordinary and unique and worth listening to and worthy of our respect, in my opinion. I think, right. the, you know, I think if, there, if there's another one, and I'm sorry I'm merging all these themes into one. But, no, that's okay. But, um, I think if there's another one, it's to me, it's about, um, you know, like we've, we've observed the world over the last 18 months that, that has galvanised into action to develop a, a vaccine to fix this situation, this pandemic, or at mm. least delay it. Um, and yet domestic violence, um, homelessness, are uh, are in epidemic proportions in this country. In a first world country, we should be ashamed of ourselves. 
that, yeah. we, that yeah. we can't galvanise in the same way. You know, every two and a half hours a woman is admitted to hospital because of a, a, a physical assault from a, a, a current or former partner. You know, that, that's how critical yeah. it is. The, yeah. there's the, yeah. and, and, and world, it's not just a Australia one. It's a global problem. And if we can't, if we yeah. can't galvanise our efforts and stop this ridiculous patch protection, like charities that are fighting for a piece of the funding pie, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to work with you because, you know, that mm. you might pinch a bit of my pie. We've got to get yeah. through this. We've got to, we've got to say, let's let's work together and let's find the vaccine that will fix this pandemic, this new pandemic. And and yeah. and, and I really believe that we can't. We've got the brain power. We've got the the um, the appetite, the 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 the, might, the brain power to fix it. We just got to employ and engage the effort to do so. Yeah, if we connect it's, and we all work together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for joining yeah. us today. Thanks, Joe. You're doing amazing work. I mean, how can people out there follow along, and also how can they help you? How can they kind of get get involved? Um, we. Um, we have three groups of people that we want to entice. And firstly, it's people that we want to help, you know, that we, we want to get the word out so we can help more people. Um, we are a volunteer run organization. So that's our second group of people that we need. We need volunteers. And obviously as a charity, we need donors. So we've, we, uh, that's our third group. So we want to talk to all of those three groups of people to, you know, explode some myths to, to engage people, to get people on board, you know, like we could all do our bit um, to to overcome this pandemic. Yeah, but but if you want to share, if you want to share my website, uh, we're on uh, all the social media channels. Happy to have any support that any of your listeners can give us. Fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll link those in the in the comments definitely. Cool. Wonderful. Well, um, thanks again, Joe. Bye. Wonderful to have you on. Um, the founder of Four Voices. And Tim, always a pleasure. Pleasure. You've been listening to Beyond the Rona. Captioned audio is available on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit beyondtherona.com to listen to previous episodes or to keep in touch. Catch you next time. <laughs>